be honest, I would put myself in the same category as D-Wade. I mean, at the end of the day, the only thing that he has that I don't have is, you know, more wins than two championships. That's it. That's a stretch, but you can see where he's coming from if we're talking playstyle similarities. Like Wade, Monte Ellis was an undersized, lightning quick shooting guard with an elite ability to score the ball. He wasn't exactly a great defender and would really struggle against bigger guards, but his speed and timing to poke the ball loose or jump passing lanes helped him amass some pretty good steal numbers. And no, Ellis didn't have the rings, the all-stars, or the all-defense selections, but that's okay because even though he wasn't Dwayne Wade, being Monte Ellis is still pretty good. And Wade also played two years of college ball, which likely increased the separation between him and Ellis. But if you look at it from the other perspective, it says a lot about just how talented Ellis was to be a 6'3 shooting guard straight out of high school who had as much success as he did in the NBA. But deciding against college may have cost him an opportunity to learn fundamentals and shed some of his ego that plagued him throughout his career. But at the end of the day, Ellis was one of the most exciting players whenever he had the ball. With his ability to embarrass someone off the dribble, drain a three in their face, or drive to the rack for a poster dunk. And even though he never spent more than two seasons on a team after the age of 26, if we're talking strictly talent and impact on the basketball court, Monte Ellis gets talked about less and less. So today, we'll talk about him a bit more and try to jog your memory. Monte Ellis grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, where his first basketball hoops were made of milk crates on wooden poles. Basketball ran in the family, as his older brother Antoine was a 6'8 prospect at Lanier High School and helped lead the team to two state championships in the late 90s. And according to Monte, his brother had everything, before he unfortunately lost it all. But after losing his childhood best friend, Monte's brother got caught up in unexpected addiction and lost a once promising career. And Monte would say that eventually his brother changed into someone Monte didn't recognize which led to Monte shutting out the world and focusing on just a couple things, with basketball being at the top of the list. Monte also attended Lanier High School and became not only one of the best players in school history, but also one of the best high school players in the history of the state of Mississippi. During Ellis's high school career from 2002 to 2005, the Bulldogs won 129 and 16 and made it to the state finals all four years, winning the championship twice. And for his high school career, he averaged 28.9 points, 4.9 assists, and 3.1 steals per game, while finishing his career with the second highest point total in Mississippi prep history. Monte's senior season would really set him apart, as he averaged 38.4 points per game while leading Lanier to the state title, en route to being named a McDonald's All-American and the Parade Co-Player of the Year alongside Lawrence North's Greg Oden. Ellis' season would also be highlighted by 65 and 72 point games versus Greenwood High School, as well as a 46 point game versus Oak Hill Academy. Ellis, who was ranked as the number two high school recruit in the nation, had originally committed to Mississippi State in what looked like one of the greatest recruiting classes in program history, as Ellis was one of four committed players ranked in the top 50. But Ellis would elect to forego college and enter the NBA draft instead on April 25th, 2005. Ellis entered the NBA draft, but wouldn't be selected until the second round, 40th overall, by the Golden State Warriors. He was the sixth of nine players drafted out of high school in 2005, and likely the big reason he fell to where he did was due to being the size of a point guard without the skill set of a point guard, yet still wanting to play point guard. Additionally, scouting reports highlighted that he had very little ability to play team basketball or rely on fundamentals due to his time spent playing AAU. Plus, Ellis had already given glimpses of the poor attitude that would follow him throughout his career, as he did not shake anyone's hand after the McDonald's All-America game, as he was reportedly upset with his coaches for not playing him at point guard enough. And this desire to be a point guard while not having the skills or decision making to be a point guard would hinder his success in the league. Even though Ellis came straight out of high school, he was already 20 years old at the time of his first NBA game. He wouldn't get much playing time in the first couple months of his rookie season, as by January 1st, he had only seen action in three games. And for a player who wanted to play point guard, he wasn't in the best situation, as the Warriors had acquired all-star Baron Davis at the trade deadline the previous year, and also had well-respected point guard Derek Fisher backing him up. Monte would only get about 18 minutes per game, but would see action in 46 out of the final 51 games of the year, which also included a season finale performance of 27 points and three steals in a loss to Utah but the Warriors would finish 34 and 48 and miss the playoffs. 
and for his rookie season, Ellis would average about 7 points, 2 rebounds, and 1.5 and assists per game. Prior to the 07 season, the Warriors parted ways with coach Mike Montgomery and hired Don Nelson in his place. Nelson was well known for his fast-paced offenses that were all about putting points on the board to make up for the non-existent defense that his teams would play. This would be Nelson's second stint with the Warriors, after having some success in the 90s with run TMC. Ellis would have a significantly larger role in the offense as he averaged the second most minutes on the team and started 53 out of the 77 games he played, while averaging the second highest shooting percentage of his career. Ellis's quickness in cuts and speed in transition was perfect for Nelson's offense, which allowed Ellis to not only score, but score relatively efficiently. And Ellis's vast improvements would see him voted to the rookie sophomore game. The Warriors had a respectable trio in Davis, Ellis, and Jason Richardson, but their other top players, Mike Dunleavy and Troy Murphy, were struggling as they just didn't seem to be a good fit for the new offense. So on January 17th, they were traded to Indiana along with two other players for a four-player return, headlined by Steven Jackson and Al Harrington. And with a more athletic team, the Warriors could fully commit to the offense and snuck into the playoffs at 42-40 and 40 as an eighth seed while adopting the We Believe moniker. Additionally, Ellis would be awarded the Most Improved Player Award after upping his averages across the board, including a nearly 10-point jump in his scoring average. As is quite well known, the Warriors would defeat the defending Western Conference champion 67-win Dallas Mavericks in six games, in a series that Ellis would struggle in as a starter for five of the six games, with his best offensive game coming in a Game 2 loss where he had 20 points on 50% shooting, and his best overall game being a Game 3 win where he had 14 points and 3 steals. Ellis would come off the bench for the final game of the Mavericks series and each of the 5 games versus Utah in a second round loss which included just 12 minutes played and 2 total points across games 1 and 2. Overall, Ellis' postseason performance could have been better, but at the same time, the Warriors weren't even supposed to make the noise that they did, and Utah's smart defense helped neutralize what made the Warriors offense so good. And for the regular season, Ellis would average about 16.5 points, 3 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. The 2008 Warriors had traded Jason Richardson in the offseason, but would finish with a better record from the year before at 48-34. But it wouldn't be enough for a playoff appearance, as this was one of the most competitive Western conferences of recent memory, as every playoff team recorded at least 50 wins. The Warriors were still just as exciting, as they had the top-ranked offense in the league, but also had the worst-ranked defense. Ellis would solidify himself as the team's starting shooting guard and formed a scoring trio with Davis and Jackson that averaged over 62 points combined. As a 6'3 guard, Ellis shot an absurd 53% from the field as he was able to get to the rim whenever he wanted due to his speed and quickness, which led to a lot of high percentage looks. And he was only averaging a three point attempt roughly every two games, which was a big dip from his first two years averaging nearly two attempts per game. But why would you take a three if you could penetrate at will anyway? Ellis would also showcase an underrated aspect of his game, which was his rebounding ability, as he would average a career-high 5 per game. Ellis would really show his scoring prowess this season, as he had 12 games with at least 30 points, 3 games where he would score at least 25 points on 80% or higher from the field, and would shoot 60% from the field during the month of February. And for the entire regular season, Ellis would average about 20 points, 5 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. Ellis re-signed with the Warriors on July 24, 2008, for six years, $66 million. But then in August, he sustained a significant ankle injury, which included a torn ligament. Ellis initially told the team that he had hurt his ankle playing pickup ball back home, but days later, the truth came out that he had hurt it in a moped accident. It was clear that this meant that he had violated one of the NBA rules regarding engaging in an activity that you know could lead to injury. But Nelson and GM Chris Mullen didn't see this violation as a big deal and didn't want to upset their new focal point of the team as Baron Davis had signed with the Clippers in the offseason. However, the Warriors president saw it differently and would end up suspending Ellis for 30 games. Ellis would return to the team on January 23rd and play in 13 games before missing the next seven due to him needing to spend time with his ailing mother. Ellis would play 12 more games after returning before being shut down for the last seven games of the season after jamming his ankle for a Warriors team that had the second best offense in the league, but still finished 29 and 53. The Warriors had also acquired Jamal Crawford midseason from New York this year and had another solid scorer in Corey Maggette coming off the bench. 
to have four players average over 18 a game. But there was something that seemed off with Ellis, even when he came back this year, that to some degree seemed to follow him for the rest of his career. When he returned, he was still lightning quick and fast, but he seemed timid and didn't drive at will like he had the season prior. He had began falling more in love with shooting the ball, and even though he had a nice mid-range game, a close-range layup will always be more efficient than a 20-footer. His three-point attempts per game nearly doubled as well, as he was now averaging one per game. So even though his scoring average only dropped by a point, his shooting percentage went from 53 to 45%. But still, he had an above-average season as he put up about 19 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 3.5 and assists per game. The Warriors were dysfunctional going into the 2010 season, as Steven Jackson had requested a trade in the offseason. And it was already well known that Ellis and Don Nelson didn't see eye to eye. Then, in the 09 NBA draft, the Warriors drafted a sweet shooting point guard out of Davidson named Stephen Curry, 7th overall. Obviously, this was the greatest move the Warriors ever made. But at the time, it was the final straw that ruined the relationship between Ellis and Nelson, and Ellis and the Warriors as a whole. Prior to the draft, Nelson and Warriors GM Larry Riley reportedly told Ellis that they were not going to draft a point guard and instead go after a big man either in the draft or free agency to build around Ellis. But after Curry was drafted, Ellis's trust was broken, and he didn't see him and Curry working well together. And Nelson would agree with this, as he had already made it known that he didn't feel like Curry and Ellis would work together, so it had to be one or the other which basically was Nelson telling Ellis that he wanted him gone. So after 9 games, Jackson was traded to the Charlotte Bobcats, which left Ellis as the clear-cut number one option. Ellis played just 64 games this season, as he missed time due to injury and illness, but he would have his best individual season of his career, as he played a career-high and league-leading 41.4 minutes per game, and finished 6th in the league in scoring, with 25.5 per game. And this season included 3 40-plus point games, and a then career high 46 in a February 3rd loss to Dallas. Curry had a great rookie season and would be named to the all rookie first team and be the Warriors third leading scorer, while McGetty would average nearly 20 a game on great shooting. But maybe Ellis was right about not being able to win with him and Steph in the backcourt, as the Warriors finished with the worst record of Ellis's career at 26 and 56. And for the regular season, Ellis averaged about 25 and a half points, four rebounds, and 5.5 and assists, along with a career-high 2.2 steals per game. The Warriors had rebranded for the 2011 season, and the Monte and Steph experiment was back for round 2. But there was one very notable missing piece, as the man that had become Ellis' nemesis was gone, as Don Nelson had resigned, as the Warriors reportedly wanted a younger coach to breathe some new life into the team. And that new coach was longtime assistant Keith Smart. But unfortunately, it wouldn't translate to a lot more success, as the Warriors finished 36-46 and 46 and missed the playoffs yet again. Even though it didn't translate to a lot of wins, Ellis and Curry were fun to watch, and Ellis had another great year, this time playing in 80 games. The Warriors also got great contributions from two offseason acquisitions in David Lee and Darrell Wright. Ellis again finished in the top 10 in scoring and started the season off with a bang, as he tied his then career high with 46 in an opening night win against Houston, where he shot 75%. He would also have a career high 7 steals on November 5th versus Utah and November 27th versus Minnesota. But overall for the regular season, Ellis averaged about 24 points, 3.5 rebounds, 5.5 assists, and 2 steals per game. The Warriors would pick up another piece of their future dynasty in the 2011 draft when they took Klay Thompson 11th overall. Ellis also would have some legal troubles come up about a month into the 2012 season as some serious accusations were made against him, but a settlement would be reached by the end of the season. Ellis would begin the season as a warrior and would even score his career high of 48 points in a February 7th loss to OKC. But then, about a month later, on March 13th, with the Warriors sitting at 17 and 21, Ellis was the main piece in a deal that sent him to Milwaukee for the Bucks defensive center Andrew Bogut. Initially, it was supposed to be Curry, not Ellis, traded to Milwaukee, but the Bucks said no to Curry due to concerns about his ankles, which made sense at the time as he had only played in 26 of a possible 39 games that season. This trade was not received well by Warriors fans as Ellis was a fan favorite, but it was probably the best thing for Ellis as he needed a fresh start. 
However, he would ironically just go to another situation, which involved two small, quick guards in the backcourt, as he joined Curry's draftmate, Brandon Jennings. Monte put up relatively similar stats in Milwaukee, although his scoring average did drop by about 4 points, in part because he was taking 3 less shots per game than he had been in Golden State, and because he couldn't find his 3 point stroke during his 27 games in Milwaukee, shooting the second lowest average of his career as the Bucks finished 31-35 and in the lockout shortened season and missed the playoffs. And for the regular season overall, Ellis averaged about 20.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and a career-high 6 assists per game. 2013 brought a full season of the Jennings and Ellis backcourt, and even though they showed they could score as the team's top two scorers, they were both quite inefficient. This would however be the first time in Ellis' career that he would play and start in all 82 games, and he would also dish out a career-high 17 assists in an April 12th loss to Atlanta. The Bucks would finish 38-44, and 44, but would still make the playoffs, the first postseason action for Ellis since the We Believe run. The Bucks would face the best version of the Miami Heat Big 3 and be swept handily, losing every game by double digits. The Bucks were no match for the Heat, and even though Ellis was the team's top scorer in the series, he shot horribly from 3 and from the free throw line. But he would come up with 2.5 steals per game. And for the regular season, Ellis put up about 19 points, 4 rebounds, and 6 assists per game. Ellis was a free agent and elected to sign with the Dallas Mavericks for the 2014 season. Dallas was a few years removed from their 2011 championship run, but were still a good team, and were hoping that Ellis could take some of the scoring pressure off of a 35-year-old Dirk and replace what was lost in OJ Mayo's departure to Milwaukee. Ellis started the season off strong, with a 32-point opening night performance versus Atlanta. He would play and start in all 82 games and be the only member of the starting lineup under the age of 32, while also being the team's second leading scorer on his most efficient shooting in four seasons. The Mavs went 49-33 and and would take the eventual champion Spurs to seven games before losing. Ellis had a much better postseason run than the previous year, as he shot much better from three and from the free throw line, en route to being the team's leading scorer for the postseason. And for the regular season, Ellis averaged about 19 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 5.5 and assists per game. Ellis' 2015 season would see him become the first player other than Dirk Nowitzki to lead the Mavs in scoring since 2000, as he would play 80 games, averaging nearly 19 a game while having 10 games with 30 or more. And the additions of Tyson Chandler, Chandler Parsons, and a midseason trade for Rajon Rondo helped the team win 50 games and get a matchup with Houston in the first round. And even though Ellis would have his best postseason series of his career, leading the team in scoring and even putting up postseason career highs of 34 points and 9 assists in a Game 3 loss, the Mavs were beaten in 5 by the Rockets. And for the regular season, Ellis put up about 19 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. Ellis decided not to pick up his player option and became a free agent after the season, where he would eventually sign with Indiana for the 2016 season, and he would play and start in 81 games as the team's second leading scorer behind Paul George. But he saw a big drop in his scoring average from the previous year in what would be his lowest output other than his rookie year. Paul George had missed pretty much all of the prior season, recovering from his horrible leg injury he had suffered in the summer of 2014. So this was going to be his first real season back, and the Pacers wanted another legitimate wing scorer so they could experiment with playing George at the 4 at times. The Pacers had a top 10 defense and were able to translate that into 45 wins, which was good enough to get them into the playoffs versus Toronto. Ellis would play and start all 7 games of the playoffs, but had a similar output as the regular season, which was lower than fans were used to out of him. And for the regular season, Ellis averaged about 14 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 4.5 and assists per game. 2017 saw another huge drop in Ellis' production. He opened the season with a 19-point performance, but would fail to surpass that scoring total for the rest of the year. Additionally, he played in 74 games, and lost his starting spot in late December. The Pacers finished middle of the pack at 42-40, but still made the playoffs, where they were swept by LeBron James and the Cavs in the first round. In a playoff series that Ellis would have very minimal contributions in, as he started just 2 out of the 4 games. And for the regular season, Ellis averaged just 8.5 points, 3 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Monte was waived soon after the season and never played another game in the NBA. 
His career was respectable, and his brief years as a 20 plus point per game scorer, you could argue, deserved at least one all-star selection. But Ellis' ego was bigger than the team in Golden State. And even though you knew how lethal he was with the ball, so did he. And if he didn't get the ball as much as he wanted, you would see it in his effort and body language. He wanted to be a point guard, but was set on his ways, which were much more suited for shooting guard. Unfortunately, Ellis was a very streaky shooter, and made shots harder than they had to be. He also had a tendency to be turnover prone, and even though his steal numbers look great, they definitely weren't from lockdown defense, as instead they were often from jumping a passing lane, which led to an easy bucket for Ellis. But with all that being said, Ellis still dominated in his prime, from a scoring perspective, and could get hot so quickly. He arguably had the quickest first step and speed with the ball during his Golden State years, and he knew how to use it. His shot wasn't great, even though he thought it was, but he had a nice stroke, and it's not like you could just sit back and let him shoot, because he could hurt you. He also played with a passion. It probably came partially from a Kobe Bryant type mindset of not believing in your teammates, so you have to do everything yourself, but he took on anybody and seemed to truly think he was the best player on the court every night. All in all, Ellis was an extremely talented and fun player to watch during his time in the league. He unfortunately had that reputation of being difficult and having a bad attitude, but if you look at his game overall and his numbers, I think it's fair to say that he's a little underappreciated, and he'll likely continue to be lost in translation as the years go on. But that's today's episode on the Mississippi Bullet, Monte Ellis. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked the video, check out this one on his Warriors teammate, or this one on another underrated player that made the jump straight from high school. Anyways, thanks for watching and see you next time.